Welcome back to another episode of The Hip. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where every single week I bring you a leader from our sector to discuss some of the biggest challenges in UK housing today. Today I was delighted to be joined by Guy Stenson, Chief Executive of Gloucester City Homes. We talk about his transition from social care into social housing, the vision he's got for Gloucester City Homes and how his background has made him think differently about the sector and how he's keen to challenge the status quo. We also talk about how they've recently joined the NHF National Homelessness Group, how he's always been a massive champion around EDI across his career and how we attract and retain the next generation of talent into our sector. I hope you enjoy the show and if you do like it, I'd ask that you like and subscribe. Kai, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, James. Good to be here. Yeah. As I always like to start, as you probably know, um, just for the purpose of listeners, would you mind just giving us a bit of an overview to yourself, Guy, if you don't mind? Yeah. So um, I'm Guy Stenson. I'm currently Chief Executive at Gloucester City Homes, somewhere I've been for just about a year. We're uh, about a 5,000 strong um, homes uh, association based in, in and around Gloucester, so deep roots in the community there and a sort of strong partner in the, in the city. Um, been in the sector myself for about sort of six years or so, kind of moved from a different organisation, uh, as I said, about a, about a year ago. But actually, most of my career uh, has been previously in, in um, health and social care. Well, actually, the interface between health, social care and, and, and housing. So I tended to work across systems, across organisations and less about organisational boundaries, more about people. And I think probably as we talk about a lot of what will come through, the focus for me has always been about people and the difference that we can collectively and individually make in people's lives um so kind of lots of experiences from 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 all over but kind of here and now really excited about a year into an organization sort of starting to find my feet and uh learned a lot in the last 12 months um some of which um has, has been good some of which I've, I've kind of made mistakes but i think as we as we all do but kind of really excited about the kind of the future now really amazing and and, and i mean you mentioned it but you, you your background was health and social care what what have been some of the routes that you've taken to get to this position because it'd be interesting for the listeners to understand kind of like health and social care is a massive part of of, of the sector because it's yeah again, like you said i, mean, I think people. it's uh, yeah very, it, i mean it's really i mean kind of how these things all fit together i think fascinates I me mean, to be fair i actually started way 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 back in the dim distant past i started at what's now Ang- anchor um so i did okay. start in housing but then uh kind of very very quickly kind of moved out but it was about um, probably sort of seven or eight years ago. So my role, I was working in West of England, uh, as I said, across health and social care and kind of largely commissioning. And I, I remember there's a couple of occasions um, where I was one particular day, I was shadowing one of our social workers in a GP practice, a multidisciplinary meeting in, in a GP practice, typical GP practice, North Bristol. They were talking about the sort of top 10 patients that the, they were working with. And what struck me through just listening to the conversation on that occasion was that literally nine out of the 10 people they were talking about, their housing circumstances had a massive impact on kind of on, on how their lives could be improved or the issues that they were all talking about. But actually nobody around the table in that meeting really understood the world of housing, the local infrastructure, yeah. knew what was there. Um, and uh, and there were sort of several occasions like kind of like that, that sort of uh, at a really micro level, but also a sort of system level where housing was never around the table never part of the conversation yeah yeah i could see and I, I i was commissioning sort of housing related support services and kind of services that are impacting on people i could see this connection and i suppose i started to get a bit frustrated or how do you kind of build build some bridges kind of across that because actually what we were doing was we were working with the same people we were talking about the same people but we just weren't making that that connection and um and actually, so I was started to look for those opportunities to sort of to be able to, as I said, to bridge that gap. And a, a kind of an opportunity, a role came up at the time with um, Stonewater, which at the time was recently established, new kind of newly formed organisation. Um, and there was a role that was a really interesting role that um, it was described at the time um, as a sort of they wanted a director without a portfolio. So basically somebody could come in and sort of have a sort of bit of a dabble kind of make sort of change happen but, but sort of make some connections really but what particularly appealed to me was the opportunity to they really wanted somebody to focus at that time on um their offer to older people right. and their supported housing 
um, kind of part, part of the business and everything. They wanted a bit of transformational kind of change. And so it was the sort of territory that I was familiar with. I'd done a lot of work, particularly with older people, really looking at in the past at kind of how you create um, the environment where people can live well in, in older age. And actually, so it yeah. felt like a really good opportunity to, to make that leap from one sector to the to, to the other and to sort of take some of that transferable skill and to um, sort of, as I said, to kind of take some of that social care, particularly social care, I think probably more than health, kind of language and experience around personalization and yeah. really understanding what mattered to people and to take that into, into housing environment. And um, I did, and I'm kind of, here kind of here, here now but I, and I think kind of gone a bit full circle because actually working in that role at Stonewater I was also working kind of quite a large geography and actually what I didn't get then was the opportunity to really work at a community level that I had been used to and kind of um and actually that's what's happened again coming back into my current role in, in Gloucester um doing all the same stuff um but as a housing provider and I think we are and I think that's that's one of the things that I've really been struck by within the sector is that I'm kind of on, on the face of it we do the same thing but actually we do it all very different and actually the relationship we have with communities varies to the type of organization that we are and um well actually so we can learn so much from, from from one another but i'm seeing locally in gloucestershire a real appetite for collaborative oh, yeah. working and, and and that's coming from the health and social care partners as well it is from 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 housing so and we've got great opportunities to build on that which we don't see everywhere around, around the country well but... i was going to say to you actually you've had two really distinct experiences there because stonewater is quite a dispersed stock isn't it i think yeah. is that right so you you might not get as much community feel and, and what's gloucester like from a housing stock perspective is it all located in a similar place or is it kind of is there some dispersion yeah, no, so, yes, yeah, so and absolutely. For me, there's the, the massive difference of, so I think with Stonewater, where, as I said, the stock was scattered from North Yorkshire down to, to the sort of the south coast and um, and no density, really, or very few areas where there's significant density. So rarely were we were sort of the, the kind of a lead housing provider yeah. locally that people would want to talk to. Here in Gloucester, actually, interestingly, um, there's... There's a large number of housing associations with small amounts of stock in in, in Gloucester. So our our five thousand homes to, to many is is not many, but actually in Gloucester is by far the most significant with most significant housing provider. And and actually most of what we have is sort of clustered in five or six sort of large sort of post-war house, housing sites. So we so again right. we've got that kind of real density of worth. But the um uh, but the real opportunity there to be an infrastructure, so to be a real anchor organisation and to kind of to, 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 to make connections and join things up. If anything, the challenge is, is actually we, culturally we've often tried to do too much. We wanted to be all things to all people. If if it needed doing for our customer, our instinct has been to sort of jump in and to, to do it. And actually that's part of the evolution for us as an organisation now is to recognise Actually, there's an incredible local infrastructure of community and voluntary organisations, real grassroots organisations who, yeah. who know their stuff and they're doing that stuff. And actually, for us, it's about building the relationship and the networks. But we can act as a bit of a sort of an, an enabler. We can be part of those conversations that join things up rather than um, needing to necessarily assume that we need need to, to, to do it. Yeah, and I, I presume that that's slightly smaller but more... Um the sport housing association there is the need to sometimes think you need to do all the services and everything perfectly and and actually it's quite difficult as well what what just just because you've been one year into post now so i suppose just for the listeners give us a bit of a helicopter overview of, of gch as it stands today and then be interested to see what what's changed in that one year and and, and what's been what's been implemented since yeah, so a, a year feel in one regard feels like no time at all, and another feels like a lifetime. Um, but it's, we're an organisation really um, at a sort of I, I start. I think I sort of almost described GCH as been a bit of a sort of a teenager. It's a long history, a long heritage actually. So our first, our oldest, and our original homes are just over a hundred years old. So we've got a sort of a heritage of over a hundred years in 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 the, in the city. Um, but as an independent organisation, about eight, eight, eight years, so kind of one of the the, the, the last stock transfer organisations. So, right. a, a kind of a, evolved a huge amount in that kind of in that in, in that time. Um, and I said a real strong 
kind of connection to the community and sort of trying to really understand customers and, and trying to be um be there be very very supportive perhaps sometimes overly supportive perhaps perhaps trying to do yeah. too much for all the right reasons um but so we're at very much at a sort of a point in a kind of a revolution where we are needing to recognize kind of how do we focus on being uh, on continuing to be really good at the bits that we do um mm -hmm. but to recognize that other people are perhaps better placed to, to to do some of that um we've got real you come back that commitment means that actually by and large our relationship with our customers is 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 good we we have we've kind of set a quite a high bar um in terms of our kind of service offer um and, and now it's about trying to sort of differentiate that for for, for others but i think i mean I, I was really lucky i came into a strong organization that was in a good place and so so what what it didn't need was a revolution it didn't meet need me turning up at sort of day <laughs> one and suddenly kind of changing everything for the sake of, of, of changing everything um uh, and interestingly we had a kind of a session with the board last week when it was an opportunity to reflect kind of a bit of a year on i think that's the sort of uh, and every now and again i'd keep asking get asking the question of sort of when's the big change going to going to come as like sort of everyone's sort of expecting it but actually we haven't but we've we've changed a huge amount in that in that time so practical examples but to relate it to us I, I i reflect on my husband and i've been we, we've been um renovating our bathroom um sounds a bit <laughs> but that but, for, yeah. but actually there's a project we've done it ourselves and it's, it's taken months um and we kind of recognize actually you don't get that uh, that amazing feeling of suddenly kind of you, you kind of go out one day somebody comes in and does the work and three days later yeah of course practice. that wow factor like, wow yeah <laughs> so, and, and i relate reflecting this the change that we've had at gch has been a bit similar to that there's not been this sudden radically it looks very different tomorrow than it did yesterday actually we have quite we've changed a huge amount we've put in greater focus on really understanding uh, so put, trying to really get behind the data, be much more data driven, trying to understand what it's telling us and trying to differentiate that offer rather than kind of everybody gets good, yeah, trying to get kind of much more tailored response. So we've been looking at our repairs offer, for example, we've been looking at how do we bring more of it in-house. So we've, for example, we've got our, we take from from next week, we take over responsibility for grounds maintenance across the uh, right. um, and across the city, and we're doing that because we know. That firstly, we can deliver it for less than we're paying for somebody else to do it. But yeah. actually, it gives us greater control, um, greater responsiveness to our, our our customers. This sort of change in the way that we um, that that we can be sort of responding to things that need to be a priority, but equally holding back on things that things that that don't really trying to focus on a culture that is um sort of keeping it so the so a mantra i keep talking about is sort of keep it simple sometimes we've we've got quite complicated processes for things but and i just simplify it like the fewer the steps the better the far the far less likely it is to go wrong if we're if we simplify it to push things totally, back. totally yeah. agree and, and am i right in thinking that you took over um the the, the last chief exec was there 16 years is that right yeah, he'd been. I mean, I think he'd been um, with with the, with the local authority for his whole yeah. whole career. Um, right. But in, in that role as chief executive, he was the original ch chief exec when um, GCH was in Almo and took it through as an independent organisation. Oh. So he well, he was very much um, GCH, and it was, was his, his baby and his his vision and, um, and and a huge. He left an incredible legacy to be to be proud of, and, and uh, but it was. Um, I guess for him, it's kind of a natural point to sort of step back and to recognise that he'd gone so far. And actually, the, 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 the colleagues needed to, to continue to take the, the business forward. Interestingly, only it's about twenty. So we've got about one hundred and one hundred and seventy-five or so uh, em, employees, and only twenty-seven of those, I think it is now, uh, transferred sort of back right. for, out to the local local authority. So. So um, the vast majority of our colleagues are, are don't come from that kind of that uh, kind of transfer. They come in from different housing organisations or from out of sector, and so we've got a real sort of melting pot of kind of experience, really. And yeah. and that's the opportunity that we've got is to really empower people to bring their their experience to the to, to GCH as, as we evolve. And that's one of the real shifts that we're sort of trying to, to, to do is to sort of create that 
that sort of sense of ownership and, and sort of empowered decision making closer to the front line as, as possible. We haven't, got to, we haven't all got to go up the, up the line yeah, for every decision to be made. And, and that's difficult for you, I suppose, uh, like, like taking over a business that you've had someone so, so part of the furniture 16 years is a long time. And I'm seeing this across the housing sector at the moment. Like, what were some of the things you told yourself when you started that role 12 months ago that... Because it's very difficult to change an organisation that's the same leader for 16 years. But what were some of the things you've looked at at that point and thought, this is what we want to be famous for. This is what I want the culture to look like. Like What what were some of the non-negotiables for you when you took yeah. over the role? So for me, I mean, I think it was it was it was really important that actually I didn't didn't sort of focus on um, the difference between me and my predecessor, and because actually for me, actually, it isn't about me. If that makes sense. I, 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 but I'm talking about because I think for for and I've seen good chief executives across the organ, or different organisations where I've kind of I've worked with or I've seen, or, and and so you sort of model yourself on the sort of the, the best bits. I think kind of thing. Yeah, of course. Um, but 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 for me, certainly, it's about I I see the role as being about creating the space and the environment for others to sort of to thrive and to su succeed and I, I just talked to colleagues about I don't see it's not about me being the brightest star in the sky it's actually about creating that sort of the galaxy where everybody can be as bright and, and, and succeed as they possibly amazing, can yeah. so, so but in short I think for me it was about focusing on the, yeah for me that I come back to that simplicity it's we want to be known to be an employer of choice. We want to be the organisation that people want to work for in, in, in Gloucester. And and at the same, because for me, great customer service comes from having um, great employees. And so, yes, we want to be customer driven. We want to deliver great customer service. But the, from, for the foundation has to be really valuing and celebrating our, our kind of our, our colleagues and creating those opportunities for people to sort of develop in, in their in their careers and that's a challenge in a relatively small organization because we don't actually have hopefully we don't have a high turnover so we don't have lots of uh, yeah, roles for promotion development but it's created it's spotted it's one of the things i've loved doing across my career is spotting talent spotting off corner options and trying to sort of nurture people to sort of stretch themselves and to realize the potential um sometimes seeing things in people that they don't necessarily see in themselves and so you know, i've Benefit, benefited from that personally in my own career I sort of people have seen me and kind of given me opportunities and open doors and kind of just given me that stretch and that challenge and sort of encouragement and and I'm I, I think that's really sort of my role you know, really is to kind of help people I, I want the team around me that are the sort of the, the best they possibly can be because that's what's going to make a difference and uh as I said I'll kind of really being there backing people up recognizing that sometimes stuff will go wrong we'll make mistakes we're human we do but again at that point it's a it's important that people feel that it's okay to sort of acknowledge they've made a mistake that we'll, we'll we'll focus on fixing it and we'll focus on learning from it what we don't need is a sort of Bruce Morton about kind of what you did and why actually it's um absolutely yeah and creating that safe space that psychological safety I suppose is, is for me is really important but equally I get that it's easy to say um people need to feel it and they need to believe it and they need to trust it and actually they'll 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 hear the words but if they don't necessarily feel it it takes time to build and um uh, and equally that type of culture that is is he is very easily lost so yeah it is well yeah. i was going to say as well you know the sector talks a lot at the moment about being customer focused and mm -hmm. i know that's a big part of what you're talking about at the moment as well and i think if you can get your team to feel autonomous in their roles to do the right thing by your customers mm -hmm. that's a great thing but what what do the symptoms look like for you in terms of good customer service and what does that look like in practice for you in terms of what is good customer service and how do we see that in the symptoms of our teams but also in yeah. the way that our customers behave i suppose there's a lot of, there's a lot in there and i think this is part of what i would take from that um that kind of the world of social care actually that makes sort of making it personal um and i think there's all sort of there's those sort of tests as a kind of uh, kind of the nan test or would your yeah. man be proud kind of, that, that, of and that, and those, those are the sort of i think those are the really easy tests because actually if, if something doesn't feel right it probably isn't and then yeah. if you if you don't uh, and i think there is something about a, a culture where people genuinely feel that they can do the right thing rather than what the sort of the rules say they should do so, so it's about having a framework it's about having um just sort of the 
the confidence to be able to do what you can but i think but but fundamentally it comes down to clarity and sense sort of um ultimately doing what ownership doing what we say we'll do and make and, and following it through uh, and my own reflection of our, our, our at gch is pretty much nine times out of ten or even so i don't know 99 percent of the time we broadly we get it right and we and, and it goes wrong and we got great we get great feedback and the customers are happy where it tends to go wrong isn't actually somebody not trying to do the right thing it's making sure that it's a why i for me simplicity is really really important because it's about creating fewer chances for things to go go wrong um yeah. but really focusing on that ownership really focusing on listening and understanding um so again when you look at complaints or sort of feedback from from customers it it's really easy to to become defensive or and and, and um, but actually if you stand back and listen up probably all this reflecting back of their frustration is because we did do something wrong or we didn't communicate or actually we weren't really re- showing them res- the respect that we, we we should be and it's ultimately everybody brought by and large wants the same thing they want to be able to live at home to feel safe to feel to be warm to be dry and kind of to be respected Absolutely. and yeah. and it's an it's making sure that we do focus on that and it's not about offering everything and, and being uh, 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 it's not necessarily being about the quickest or but it's about really understanding what matters to to somebody and if you create the space to really hear for customers so you, you can't be customer centric um or you can't be customer led if you're not really listening to what customers are telling us you haven't got the the avenues and the forum for people to share their experiences and if you sort of if you if you try to be defensive and sort of to turn off those, those so so creating the bumping spaces uh, where you can hear what really matters to customers um, creating different opportunities for them to share their their experiences and then more importantly listening to it and responding to it not necessarily doing everything they said but understanding kind of what's behind that yeah and uh, well as you said a, a while ago like keeping it simple i mean really simple i mean a lot of this is follow through isn't it um the one thing that i know we talked a little bit offline about and and, and i know you're big on is how do we disrupt the kind of status quo of the industry like i i feel I feel at the moment we're playing it safe as a sector because we don't want to upset the apple cart on process. And sometimes we lose sight of some of the things that are really important based on the fact that this is how we've always done it, or this is how it should be done because this is what the book says it should be done like. Mm-hmm. So what's your thoughts on that? How do we be brave, take more risks, be more disruptive as a sector? Do you know, and, and again, this is one of those things that's, again, it's really easy to talk about and, uh, and then so much harder to do. So can, what's one of the... <laughs> So I, I would encourage, always encourage teams to sort of look at your process, look at your question, do you need to, do you really need that step? Do you need to do, kind of, to do that? And, and we need to, but it's interesting that um, everyone also will agree, oh yes, there's a real opportunity to simplify it, but actually, every, but equally there's always a thousand and one reasons why you can't take that particular yeah. step out or why you've got to follow that particular process. But actually, I think, um, I'm the, to answer your question, it's about, start it's almost about starting again it's not a, if you tinker with a process actually you'll get very marginal change if you if you start with a blank sheet of paper and kind of go back to basics what is it you're trying to 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 achieve um redesign from the beginning um then you've got a great chance if you look at the banking sector for example and um, so the likes of monzo and starling or whatever yeah they're able to do something very different and um because they start from from scratch like then, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're not trying to sort of redesign a sort of antiquated it system that's good uh, and i think we're trying to we're often trying to do that we're, we're sort of hampered with what we've got and the mm-hmm. how do you make the technology that we've got work and i think for us it's about learning from our sector it's not learning for we, we don't compare ourselves to to each other compare ourselves to the to the best in class sort of up that up the experience that we've got from from outside the sector and how do we bring bits of that into what we're, we're doing but again it's about really involving people the right people so if, you, if for example if you're looking at trying to redesign your I don't know, antisocial behavior processes yeah. and experience well you need to involve people who, who are experiencing antisocial behavior who have been through and have had had kind of real life experience of kind of of being on the other end of our experience and equally you need to involve the colleagues who are doing it who will know the frustrations and the bits that don't kind of don't work but it is about stepping back and and kind of 
starting afresh really so um i don't know kind of an example from that kind of my sort of previous world in health and social care is kind of looking at doing some work with um adults yeah. with learning disabilities around kind of um uh, the, the task of ultimately i was given was to sort of to massively reduce the budget around learning disability day services um but if i set about doing that i'd sort of just get a really rubbish service was actually what did was bring people together and really start to understand what do they want from life and how might we able to do that and actually you then design something totally different what you do you don't design different day services you design the, the the support that people want in the, and need in their lives and i think it, it's that parallel kind of ultimately stepping back and looking at what we what we're doing um but yeah kind of going out and but more importantly it's about being brave enough to try things it is. and uh, and sort of learn as you go along test it if it doesn't work stop try again and um be brave really and, and uh, we have to, we have to do we have to do that because we're not going to change it fundamentally what we do as a housing provider is relatively simple yeah simple kind of stuff but we yeah. can't get massive change if we get uh, kind of uh, kind of if we restrict ourselves and the other thing is about bringing in and i'm sure we'll talk about sort of diversity in the sector but the other thing is bring in people from outside a sector with different life lived experience experience working in different um industries that we can yeah. learn from which, which again is another you know i i sit on many panels to interview candidates mm -hmm. for roles and, and and we work alongside clients on, on consultancy and there's genuinely uh lack of risk takers in our sector and i'm not not, not berating anyone for that because if we're looking for a director of asset management they must have asset management well that that really shrinks the pool down yeah. but unless we bring more experience into the sector we won't ever take any more risks and i and mm. i see that from recruitment decisions mm. do we take the bold decision with the person that's got all the potential but not the skill set or do we take the safe and steady person that's done it before and I think we've got to practice what we preach sometimes mm. because it's so easy to take that person that can yeah. learn tomorrow and do the role from day one. Um, yeah, and actually they'll be bored quite quickly, won't they? If yeah, of course. If you're already <laughs> doing it. But I think, yeah. I mean, we've talked here at GCH about we need to stop recruiting based on experience, but it, because it's attitude and, and uh, that really makes the difference. You can most of what we can do, you can train really, really yeah. quickly, uh, uh, and and I think you see it that if you. Um, uh, if you do just bring in somebody who's done the job elsewhere, well, they're not going to bring anything particularly new. Not and uh, I'm not particularly holding myself as a great example, but actually I'm somebody who was able to come in at sort of director level from out of, out of sector. And I quite quickly found my way around and kind of, yeah, yeah. I've learned, okay, I haven't got decades of experience of housing management. Um, I've got decades of experience of living in a house um, uh, and, and uh, which is relevant. <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm actually, but I'm able to bring something new and different. And, and I think it's, it's, it's looking at, so I've, we've just here, we've, just recruited somebody into a comms uh, uh, communications role. She knows she's local. She knows the area. She's got the connections with the with the sort of local media, but didn't know housing. Um, but yeah. it's very, very is it to learn? It <laughs> and, 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 and but is able to bring something new. Whereas if we'd have restricted ourselves to somebody who'd been a communications manager in a housing industry and New Gloucester, well, we'd have a very small pool of people to choose from. Um, uh, but actually, that freshness of somebody coming in and asking really simple questions or bringing in that different experience that 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 makes us stronger but actually that really i think that really plays into the, the, the sort of the discussion and debate about professionalism within within the sector have we all got to be cih level five yeah. qualified well well it's a bit of paper um and and yeah. and yes we need to be professional in our in our approach and yes we need certain roles we need to have people um with with appropriate skills and around but but what we want is great people with the right attitude who can um kind of make things happen yeah 100 percent, totally agree uh, and we've got to share passion i think uh like i'm doing a lot of work in the northwest region from a homelessness perspective and i know that you've joined recently the nhf national home talk me through that a little bit because because yeah. i'd love to understand a little bit more about it and what was the motivation behind it was yeah, so I think I talked to before. So one of my areas of interest has always been working with people on the sort of, I guess, the margins. It's the sort of people whose voice isn't heard, or perhaps um, 
kind of struggling to be supported. And I think home, if, if from a home, within housing, if our remit and our role is about create, making sure that everybody's got a place to call home, um, there can be no greater priority group than people who are currently um, not without one. And and I think and I, and I'm really really proud here at, at GCH that actually we've got a significant. Um, homelessness services or we've invested quite significantly in developing developing our our offer to support um kind of homeless people kind of locally and uh, our most recent scheme we just opened in Stroud that's just a couple of weeks ago um brand new service that um that again right from the start we've designed in a way to be able to support people with with pets because again we know that uh, for a lot of people are, 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 um, who are homeless actually the barrier to be able to get somewhere is actually being able to take their dog or their cat, cat or whatever. And it sounds really? simple and silly, but yeah, it's, yeah, uh, okay. But um, but actually, for me, uh, it was it is why I've been involved because I do think that's a, it's really important that we kind of give voice and support to those people in the greatest need. Any one of us at any point could find us circumstances change and and need a kind of a, a sort of a helping hand, as kind of a step up. And in providing homeless services, is important. Or in did any support service, I think for me it's important that we're really valuing that person's life and experience, and they shouldn't be uh, be sort of making do. They shouldn't be grateful to have a roof over their head. Actually, we should be making sure that we're providing quality accommodation uh, um, that yeah. shows that, that gives them the, the sort of the foundation on which to start to rebuild their their lives. Uh, and I can previously done a lot of work working with young homeless homeless people, and again those services that they, they have the opportunity to totally to transform people's lives yeah. if we put in the support the infrastructure yeah. and the uh kind of uh, and the, we believe in those in, in the people there and to give them that opportunity and um uh, yeah I, I don't think there's, there's there's a more important role within the housing sector than to tackle kind of I agree. And, and we do some work with some of the local charities and the overriding so it so we have most of our team or, or all of our team donate a, a half a day a month to charity to go and do and we're doing homelessness because it's a massive yeah. problem in manchester and my overriding emotion on this is we're not solving the problem at source we're yeah. trying to fix the problem yeah. beyond and, and i think it's getting worse in manchester i don't know what it's like in gloucester but from my point of view it's how do we fix the fact that we're taking less funding out of building new homes. We've got a massive housing crisis and not enough properties to house people yeah. that we need. And yet it feels, and without getting political, because I never do on this programme, but it's how how do we encourage housing associations to build more houses, to give people more opportunity if the money's not available? What is the solution in all of that? I, I mean, I think that's, that's perhaps one of the biggest challenges that we've got at the moment, because I, I, I think we Building more homes is clearly and, and kind of important. Yes. That that's fundamentally the, the problem that we've got is the kind of the shortage of homes and the kind of the impact that has on on cost uh, 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 of yeah. homes. And I mean, I know for example in our development program, we're really passionate about making sure that a good proportion of that at least is is a social rent as well. So we yeah. we're not just sort of building and sort of sort of maxing the, the price. We're putting them out kind of unaffordable. Mm -hmm. um, and can, we've got some of the lowest rents um, sort of locally and all, kind of all of our stuff, because it's important that people can afford, afford to, kind of, to live in those. But actually, as a housing association, um, and so the challenge that our board is grappling with is that, yeah, we can we can invest in building more and more homes and there's a desperate need for them. But equally, we've really got to, uh, uh, for, for me, I think as a sector, we need to be really making sure that we're investing in the current homes that we've, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that we've, that we've got, <laughs> isn't it? Is that, and that's the, that's the challenge for us, I suppose, is how to, end of the day, we've got less and less, there isn't the money to go around, how we prioritise it. Um, and that is, and I think if you look at some of the, um, the sort of the challenge that we've got at the moment, is is about investment in existing stocks. So perhaps, Whilst we've not been bringing the number of new homes that are needed, um, what we have been doing as a sector is is putting a greater emphasis on this sort of the shiny and new, and sort of maybe taking the eye off the ball sometimes. Oh, and and, and you look at it, what a time to become a chief exec in your first role in housing. Um, you know, the cost of living crisis, the decarbonisation, getting houses to EPC, that yeah. the new build housing crisis, the homelessness crisis. Yeah. 
I mean, the list goes on and how people think we're going to be able to afford all those things. Clearly, you you, you can't build new homes and you've got tenants that can't afford gas and electric yeah. in the properties. Yeah. <sighs> The, the challenge is, is a vast one um, and probably one that we could do a full episode <laughs> on. But but one thing I'm really keen to pick up on you is I know you're a huge champion of EDI um, and just wanted to understand sort of like your focus, how you found that being in the sector and what challenges or opportunities it's presented for you as an individual and, and how we can get more people into the sector from an EDI perspective because... Yeah. We talked offline and I think uh, sometimes the spotlight goes off it sometimes and then it's back on and depends yeah. on circumstances. But keen to understand your experience as you've lived it and and also how we can do better. Yeah, and, and it is something that really matters matters to, to me. And I, again, part of my sort of personal experience so as, a, as, a, as a gay man starting my career, kind of developing my career, kind of having both doors closed and doors opened kind of for me and sort of seeing role role models um has sort of massively impacted and influenced me but uh, and I, I i've got my own personal lived experience and, and i can't relate to what kind of others in their own circumstances but what it does give me is that drive to um really to focus on edi and kind of make sure that we're sort of diversifying our, our workforce and uh, and that commitment to sort of take practical steps. So again, it's uh, and for me, the, the, the main thing about it is actually doing. It's easy to talk about. Again, it's, it's actually doing something about it. So again, another example from earlier in my career when I was responsible for going off and telling everybody else about employing people with learning disabilities. Um, I made sure that I created I created four roles in my team that, uh, that yeah, employed people. So it's kind of so it's sort of a very practical sort of demonstrating it myself and actually doing things. And again, but coming into into my the opportunities I've had in the housing sector, um, both in terms of recruitment and for for colleagues and but also for board members. I think it is about um again it's it's doing something different. It is about looking at the language you use, it is about where you're going to it's about it's, it's actually sometimes it's a sort of slightly bending the rules probably if it's if you're a, if you're like, like, at the end of the day if you if you don't get um you can't complain um the, you can't just not recruit because you're not getting the, the shortlist you've actually got to go and get the cancer so it's actually about making sure you, you're going out and finding people on that just yeah. sticking an advert in inside housing isn't going to attract different people um uh, uh so it is about going in fi- going to where people are uh, and, and i've done over the years the fairest things so sort of trying to recruit in different ways using different techniques sort of i don't know whole hosting um kind of facebook live type sessions that encourage people to come in and find out about a job using video in, um, applications, sort of doing things in a, in, a, in a different way. But it's also about um, when you're shortlisting, don't kind of don't just kind of go kind of if there's if there's two people who are broadly the, kind of broad, broadly the same, kind of don't go for the one that you, you're necessarily feel safest with, uh, the person who looks like you, kind of go go for the other. Um, yeah. And uh, and just make sure you're actively creating more diverse um Kind of shortlists because if you've got a diverse shortlist, there's a chance of getting a diverse candidate, uh, sort of a more diverse. A hundred percent, yeah. Uh, and um, but again, really, really pushing that you, equally. You, but you've got to get you've got to get that range of talent coming forward. And sometimes, so we've just been recruiting for new board board members, and um, again, really successful and bring in two people onto our board who come from very different backgrounds, kind of bring different Amazing. experience and, and we'll start yeah. to shake things up again. But equally, we saw one candidate, he was really, really fascinated as he kind of, he brought something new and different. Um, and I'm sure in time we'll be, we'll be a great board member, but our sense from just the conversations we've had with him here and now at this point in time, he wasn't yeah. perhaps quite ready. But actually we were able to find another way of support and in involving him to join one of our committees so we can invest in him and help him to gain the experience that he might well need to be able to yeah. move into a, whether he joins our board or somebody else's it's bringing in a different different kind of talent creating but it's it, it, it's it's going beyond just talking about it um and but equally recognizing that you can't suddenly change everything overnight uh, and equally it's not about being tokenistic it's not appointing somebody because because they've got a disability or because they're black it's, it's about getting God. those people in the room and yeah, really understanding what they want uh, and and taking a different approach so being confident that somebody with a different 
perspective is going to, to bring something, but you've got to really want it and mean it. And practically, it's about measuring it and monitoring it. So we're, we're given visibility. So uh, so just looking at the statistics, so kind of how uh, how are we, what's the sort of the drop off rate from the number of applications? Okay, so. Are we getting the applications and it turns, it turns into, um, in, into appointments? But but you can't take the art it's not something you can do for six months and um, no no it's not and it comes back to that being brave again you know like the one thing that i found during the the black lives matter thing i think we talked about this offline is that i didn't want to say the wrong thing you know mm. straight white male really passionate about mm. doing more in this in this part of the sector but i felt that education was the key for me yeah. like i had to go and live the experience and go yeah. I'm, I'm never going to be able to live the exact experience but i can speak yeah. to people and understand how they feel yeah. how do we educate our leadership teams our management teams and beyond to feel the way you do about this subject because naturally you know we need more than just a leader to be behind this we need everyone in the sector to to really really want to make change that we want to see I, I, and my worry on that is just the brave decisions need to be made and that's difficult yeah. but i think sometimes we um it is about being brave and it is about doing it but because i think but i think sometimes we all oh, we'll get advice from i don't know hr teams or yeah, of consultancies like yourself or oh, you can't yeah. do that and like yeah, of course. Kind of, and it's and of course those rules but equally we've got to if we keep doing what we've done then we're not going to get that you know, get that yeah. change but, but ultimately I, I think the real difference is we've got to create a sector that looks appealing and interested and people want to come and work in um, and oh. and that fundamentally that's the thing that's really going to make a difference um because the the one of the, the joys, the benefits of the house is actually, it, you can come in from any back, any back. Well, we we want people who are accountants and IT people and HR yeah. people and comms people and housing people and also repair. Well, actually, you can come from anywhere, and so if we can make ourselves look and be attractive and attractive and a place that you want to kind of want to come and work, and then that's the starting point. We need greater visibility of, of that. Fundamentally, we know a lot of more and more people are sort of starting to reflect about what's important to them in their, their lives. And being able to work in a sector with a strong social purpose appeals to far, far more people than it ever has. Um, so we, we, we've kind of got a kind of an open door uh, and a kind of real opportunity. But but if, if we then do that and then we still just recruit people who kind of look like us and bring the same views as us well we're not going to kind of to, to give, no. get that 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 change so um it is about looking at those processes and um challenging ourselves is so when that person does say something a bit different does reflect that they they kind of want a different uh, for us to not to be scared of embracing that and well that's it. it yeah and that's it and we did a survey recently to to a, a decent portion of candidates on our uh, in our network and we were asking what the motivation to leave a role was now and and yeah. honestly money was about fourth fifth on the yeah. list planet social purpose community the lots of things rated much higher than just the financial yeah. elements yeah. and i think that that lends itself to our sector flexibility yeah. the able to work remotely yeah. all the things that we can offer yeah um, how we package that up i don't think we do a good job yet um, we, we could do better um the other thing i was going to ask you quickly because one thing that i think solves the diversity thing in one foul swoop potentially or, or certainly one massive strand would be really carving out the next generation making our sector look sexy because it is sexy and can be really good for for new careers and start to really harness new talent into the sector through yeah. the next generation yeah. how can we attract those people and, and 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 what can we do as an overall sector to really start to hone into that we training have to be, level? So yeah I mean, I, mean, I mean i think there are some brilliant graduate opportunities or, or and apprenticeship opportunities to come in, in into the sector and yeah. so and i i've seen um with a couple of those schemes so with apprenticeships and working with the the, the gem program so that yeah, the, kind of bring in some brilliant people um in um but actually when you talk to that and and uh, when you talk to those people those kind of the potential candidates there understanding their motivations and what they're interested in doing is that yeah that they, they want 
Uh, often it is about that social purpose, actually, and I think, yes. and, it, and, it that, and, it, and it's and it's kind of bringing in. Uh, I in my last role we had the opportunity to, to um, support some students who are on a housing course um, in their final year to do some some placements. Again, it was, I and mean, again, it's creating those opportunities for people to come in and to see the real real world and, and and sort of to try things, to try kind of to try roles, but but bringing in. Um, development opportunities at the start of the career and we're looking at decision how we can potentially introduce some uh, graduate trainee roles to give them experience across the across the business and then it's going out and finding those those candidates now in all likelihood when we're going out and looking whether it's um, bringing encouraging apprenticeships at any age or whether it's people coming out of university they're probably not going to be sitting there thinking actually i really want a career in housing yeah, course, they might course. but probably not um yeah. so we need to sort of need to be there we've got to sell it we've got to sell the, the sort of the, the the opportunity and that means that we've got to tell a, a much more positive story about the difference that we're that we're making and the reality is stuff's gone wrong in this sector and we've, we've made we've, we've collected no six but equally we are day in day out across the housing sector by and large we're doing incredible things making a massive positive difference to people's people's lives and giving us and we just need to tell that that story it's not to detract from the improvements that we've got to make but equally we can't we, we shouldn't be embarrassed about the amazing work that we're that, that we're doing and the difference that we're making to people's lives no, no, I agree. Um, I, I totally agree. And, and, I, and I do think that, yes, there's mistakes being made, but they're not being made with malice. They're being no. made by, no. by, by the wrong, wrong processes. Um, and, and as we wrap up, like the final thing I just wanted to understand from you is what, what do you think the future of the sector looks like? And, and certainly what would you want it to look like? And then the same question really for Gloucester, like what, what do you want to see in the blue sky thinking what would you love to see in, in in your future career um i mean i think for the sector as a, a, a whole i think we've just been talking about you know i suppose that reputation and things. So I, I think we, we, we again we do need to be focusing on an aspirational product you know really i mean if you think back into those my 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 grandparents lived in and um, they i'm lived in a, uh, what was a brand new built council house in kind of Nottingham, ultimately they bought it, but actually the, the, the kind of the aspiration there of living in those communities, kind of wanting to sort of to build their new and exciting kind of lives and feeling that they were moving into something that was something that people aspired to do. And I think we do, we do need to be looking at that as, um, so uh, for me locally, I, I want people to want to live in a Gloucester City Homes home. Yeah, I want us to be, to be not just building nice, shiny new ones but again really investing in our in our current homes and our current stock to make sure that they are homes that that give people the kind of the life chances and the aspirations so so again locally there's a lot of talk about um opportunities for young people growing up locally in Gloucestershire for loads of jobs in largely down the road in Cheltenham in the sort of cyber industries and I'll, I'll, what what I want to make sure is that the young people growing up in our homes have the same opportunity to access those those roles as they do in the sort of private sector new build developments kind of down, down the road. Yeah. Um, so it is about us focusing on the basics. It is about us doing kind of um, a, a good good job, and it is about us evolving and um, kind of building on on kind of what what we do and creating those communities where people can kind of work and thrive i think we will we need to see more homes being built but we do need to see a greater focus on on kind of improving what we've what we've got there's there will always be an, a need for yeah. uh, for social housing um and uh, it it may well evolve in terms of the sort of the structure how the how these things are delivered that but it, that that shouldn't really matter it doesn't matter whether it's council housing or housing association housing or indeed some other new model that we haven't kind of met before the core purpose is about providing good quality affordable homes that people can live in and that genuinely affordable homes um that people can can live in and and start their lives build their lives and kind of grow old and kind of, kind of yeah. move on and, and that's perhaps the, probably one of the biggest challenges and, and i don't know what the solution is but actually when you look at because we see so many people sort of kind of trapped um in the, the their family may have grown but they, they they sort of started off in a two-bed 
flat in Gloucester, whatever, where they've now got three kids, a dog and a parrot or whatever, and they're kind of, <laughs> honestly, they, they can't, they're stuck. Um, and yeah. there is something about, as I said, to how do we enable a bit more mobility, I think, and and because equally you'll have people at the other end of their um, kind of like kind of who, who are kind of very happy to downsize and release a family home, but again, it's really hard to move. And it's and we 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 cr- we've got lots of rules that often self imposed rules that that don't really reflect people's needs and lives and, and the fluidity of life. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. What a lovely way to finish. And 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 I think honestly just such an inspirational guy like i've loved this session and i think like more people like you in our sector and more people lobbying change in our sector will really really push us on i i, I can't wait to see what you do at gloucester and and, and, I, and I look forward to, to tracking your journey but but thank you for being part of the podcast yeah thanks i enjoyed it thank you cheers guy thank you for listening to another episode of the hip if you'd like to hear more from us please be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform We are also running a 30-minute clinic free of charge to any clients that want to recruit in a more inclusive way. For more information, please reach out to us on our website, andersonjames.com.